And welcome today to today's mindfulness session. I'm Eric Galvin, president of Connecticut. And thank you to Copper Beach for supporting Mental Health Connecticut and Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, thank you to Camilla Smith for facilitating today's session. You know, we think about uh, our involvement as a company. Connecticut is a, a proud and longtime sponsor of Mental Health Connecticut because we believe in the, the whole person being healthy physically and mentally. Um, and really, I encourage folks to take advantage of May's mental health, uh, mental health Month programming and invest some time in making your self-care a priority. Um, what, one little point, and, and Kim's worried right now because I'm ad-libbing, but I would just say this, there's somebody in my life that keeps saying, you know, you, you, you need to be kind to yourself. You need to, you need to be kind and take care of yourself. And, it, and I think this is a... Um, this is a month where you could bring that that thought forward and, and keep it um, keep it front of mind as you're going through uh, what is a, a challenging world that we're in today. Um, our physical and mental health both require attention daily, and um, and I, I I do applaud everybody for spending the next half hour investing in yourself. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Camilla, for today's session. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, and you know I'd like to start off by just saying you know expressing my gratitude for being here and being able to share the space. Um, just a quick background of kind of who I am and um, a bit of what I bring to the table. So I'm a psychotherapist. Um, I also teach at the University of New Haven um, and practice yoga. So my, my understanding of mental health definitely is, I'd say kind of holistic and varied in approach. Um, and today I specifically want to talk about trauma and our stress response and how that impacts our breath. Um, also, you know, what implications that has when it comes to breathing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me one second. Can everyone see that okay? Okay, great. So I think it's particularly important whether we are um, you know, in the field of helping individuals that are processing trauma, or perhaps we ourselves in some ways process trauma. And especially right now during this time of so many changes with COVID, um, collectively, that has been a really stressful situation. And I think it's fair to say that all of our stress response has been activated by the constant changes in our day to day, you know, in the way that we socialize and the way that we've conducted our life. So I think now more than ever, there is a shared kind of humanity in the aspect of um, what it means to process stress and how we carry that in our bodies. I think it's a particularly important time to, to really talk about these things. So first I'd like to start off with just some, um, what I think is fun, <laughs> brain talk. Um, so the brain is only about 2% of our whole body mass. It's about, it's a consistency, it's a sliding, um, consistency of like jello. So it's this rather small, really light, jello-like structure um, that doesn't take up that much space in our body, but it does take up 25% of our whole oxygen. So all the breath that we take in, this 2% little jello-like structure is gonna take up a quarter of it. And um, air or oxygen, you know, helps us really to, um, it helps our body obviously in, in every way, all of our organs. Um, so when we talk about our breath, it's particularly important to our physical, but also our cognitive health. Um, when we breathe in, it's what really helps our brain access different processes. Um, so it's particularly important. Another um, fact that's not on here is our brain consumes 30% of our glucose. So glucose being, um, for lack of a better term, let's say the sugar, right, that we get from food, from nutrients. So our brain takes up 30% of everything, our energy and our oxygen, right? So brain health and body health really kind of go together. Um, it's also the fattiest organ in our body. So 60% fat, which is, uh, this is where, as far as nutrition base, we find that um, essential fatty acids are so healthy for our brain um, because of the, the fat content. And then another fun one, um, it generates 23 watts of power. So if we somehow find a way to source it, we would each be able to light um, a light bulb, which I think is pretty neat. Um, so our brain has this incredible capacity and our um, cognitive or physical processes are dependent on our ability to breathe, right? This automatic 
um, response that we have. So specifically today, I want to focus on trauma. Um, so I think it'd be important for us to start with, well, what is trauma? And um, so the American Psychological Association defines trauma as an emotional response to a terrible event, like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. Immediately following the event, there tends to be usually shock, denial, and then there's what, uh, so this would be more what we call acute symptoms, right? So in the moment symptoms. And then we have what are more kind of chronic symptoms um, that some individuals may experience more than others. And that's what may then lead to developing, let's say a PTSD or an acute stress response disorders. Um, so some of these reactions could be um, just different sorts of emotions, flashbacks, problems in our relationships and somatic symptoms like headaches, nausea, stress, tension. Camilla, I'm so sorry yes. to interrupt. Yeah, <laughs> um, no problem. I'm just watching the chat and it looks like some of our um, deaf participants are can't see the ASL interpreter. Do you know how to oh, change that? Let's see. Oh, right here. I keep it right here. Perfect. Yes, okay. I think that that should work. Thank you. Sure. Um, so when we look at, or when we're talking about trauma, we tend to think of trauma as a big, you know, kind of big trauma as natural disasters, car accidents. And we call that, uh, we're gonna call it the big trauma, the big traumatic experiences that we might have. Um, but we also have kind of little traumas. So these are more day-to-day -day, um, kind of events that we may experience that also might lead to a stress response. And these little traumas, um, are things that, you know, maybe a lot of us might identify with, whether it be problems in our relationships, financial insecurities. Um, it could be things, for example, for children like bullying. And these are more, again, things that uh, might be more um, kind of widespread. So the way that trauma impacts our body, it impacts our body in a number of different ways. And we're all uniquely affected by trauma and the way that our body responds to it. And trauma tends to be stored in our body and also in our memory. So by body, it means that our, our, each, our individual bodies have a way of responding to trauma, whether we have, let's say, a hyper arousal. So it means that we respond, um, we overactively respond, or maybe we have an under arousal. So some of the things that might happen with trauma is we have changes in our brain, so in our brain functioning. Um, we also have changes in the way that our brain thinks. So kind of these what we call pathways. So our brain might uh, kind of gravitate towards a specific way of thinking as a result of trauma. We have changes in our hormones, the way that our body releases hormones. So we may have an overactivation of let's say the stress hormone cortisol or adrenaline. Um, we also have changes in the way that our body actually even processes toxins. Um, so the way that our organs work and our body's ability to um, effectively kind of process the foods that we're eating or environmental toxins and stresses. It also changes our nervous system. And by that, it's the way that our body responds. We also have changes in our brain waves. Um, there's something called alpha wave intrusion that can happen with trauma. So we have different wavelengths. And as we kind of step into deeper, more restful states, um, we're able to kind of switch from different brave, or, uh, brain waves. But when we experience constant trauma um, or stress, our brain can kind of get, let's say, stuck in a specific um, way of functioning. So we don't actually tap into deeper levels of relaxation. So when maybe perhaps we're trying to sleep or we're trying to unwind, our body may have a little bit of a harder time. We also have changes in the way that our body releases neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are these uh, messengers in our body that allow us to, to feel good, to relax, to send signals throughout our body. Um, and then we have changes in actual like cellular structures in our immune system. So big, big changes. And some individuals um, may be more apt to have what we call somatic experiences, so in their body, right? So they may process and store body in, um, or, or store trauma in their bodies. And certain things um, that we might refer to as triggers, like flashbacks, thoughts, could cause a stress response. 
Um, I want to go, I want to talk about our nervous system really briefly. And uh, the reason why I would, would like to talk about this is because I really want to highlight the differences in how all of us respond. So our central nervous system, um, one of the, the primary, let's say, parts of our central nervous system, it's called the autonomic uh, nervous system. And that has two separate parts of it, which are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And they work together, right? So when one activates, the other one comes in afterwards and it maintains rather a balance or homeostasis in the way that our body responds to stress. Um, and we need both of them to function together so that we can have you know, a balanced mind, a balanced, a balanced body. So our sympathetic nervous system is what, let's say, turns on our stress response. So when we are in a situation that we maybe experience danger, discomfort, or stress, our sympathetic nervous system turns on and it activates what you know many of us probably can have heard before, right? Our fight, flight, or freeze response. But it primarily activates our fight and flight. Um, and it starts to release all of the hormones. It gets our body ready to respond to danger. Um, and then we have the parasympathetic nervous system. And if we have any Spanish speakers here, the word para means stop. Um, so that's my kind of mental um, hack to remember what the parasympathetic system does, right? So it's kind of like the stop sign. So it stops the stress response or pulls the brakes on the stress response. And what it does is it starts to slow everything down. It slows our heart rate down. It sends hormones to relax our muscles. Um, and it just starts to relax after we've had like a big, right? So we activate with our sympathetic and then we stop and deactivate. So we call the parasympathetic our rest and digest system. But what happens with trauma is, so when we experience a traumatic event or stress in any form, our stress response system activates. Um, and if we have a lot of trauma or if we're in a state of constant stress, um, whether it be our environment, maybe the way that we're processing, then our stress response system is always, let's say, on. It's constantly turning on. And over time, this affects our, our nervous system. So here, individuals uh, can kind of, we are all unique. So some, people's may, some people may get stuck in what we call kind of like the on system, right? So this would be the sympathetic response. Or some people may be more in like off response. And if someone is stuck in like, let's say on mode or in stress, they may have symptoms like anxiety, panic, restlessness, just always feeling like, let's say on edge, right? Or keyed up so that um, a stressor might, might be kind of startling and they are more apt to respond, um, more quickly respond to stressors. Um, and on the flip side of that, we have the parasympathetic, which is kind of like the down, right? So some individuals may respond more of like with an off response. So this may be more depression, tired, kind of just having a harder time getting up, doing the things, having a little bit more of a harder time responding emotionally to stressful events. And again, all of our bodies have a tendency to either respond with a more sympathetic response or a more parasympathetic response. So these are just briefly some of the things that are the either system does that we are really fascinating. So for example, the sympathetic system, it dilates our pupils. So it gets, actually the sympathetic system changes the way that we see and it gets us ready to run. Um, it gets our, everything really sharp and clear. And our parasympathetic helps us to see everything around us. Um, it, our sympathetic system also gets our heart rate going because it's trying to pump more blood to our organs and it's trying to get us ready um, to respond. And in the you know, opposite from that, we have the parasympathetic, which slows our heart rate. Um, it, it just gets our muscles nice and relaxed. So pretty interesting how our stress response is responsible for different mechanisms. So when we talk about the breath, it's really important to understand how our ability to, to breathe is really natural and instinctual and beautiful gift that we've, we've been given can impact our trauma. Um, so we know that through just studies, um, some individuals may have 
and activation of their stress response when they take deep breaths. So something that's important to recognize, um, we often talk about the value, and it is incredibly valued, um, of breathing and deep breaths and just kind of enjoying that beautiful uh, air. However, it is important to recognize that some of us, some people, we may have our bodies more than anything, may have a hard time taking those deep breaths. Um, and that's because of our natural tendencies to either have like a hyper response or an under response. So some things that are important when we think about breathing, whether we're incorporating a breathing practice into our lives, or maybe we're working um, with people and trying to help them find balance and reduce their stress, is we want to start by simply bringing awareness to the breath and the body. So we don't necessarily want to change it, and we wanna honor that our body um, has this natural way of functioning that's unique to us. So we just wanna notice, right? How is my breath? Is it short? Just, can I take a nice big breath? <sighs> um, or maybe we wanna notice where we hold stress. Maybe some of us hold stress um, oftentimes in our neck or in our shoulders. We might have a little tension, right? Or maybe in our bellies. We might feel just um, discomfort in our stomach. So we just wanna become aware. And the next part, when we think about releasing stress or tension is we wanna think about simply releasing and letting go in a way that feels comfortable and safe for our body. Some of us may feel that a, a nice big breath and I think we do this automatically, right? Some, some of us, maybe we find ourselves going, oh, right? Like that may be just a natural way of doing it. That, um, or maybe we release in other ways. Some people find that they love to dance or they like to go on a walk or maybe they find themselves petting their, uh, their, their animals, pets or going outside. So we all have our own way that is, and we know that works for us. So we just wanna um, be really kind and gentle with ourselves and aware of what is going to work for our bodies and accept it without having to push ourselves past the point of what is comfortable and safe for us. So when we think about uh, regulating our stress, we're gonna break this down into two categories. We can either focus outward or we can focus inward. And focusing outward is a really good technique when we're having a little bit of a hard time being present with our emotions, right? When we're having a bit of a hard time being present with the feelings that we're having, or maybe it's a little hard to check in with our, you know, whether it be anxiety. Um, so then we wanna focus out. And what that means is we wanna bring our attention, our awareness outside of our body experience. And things for this might be mindfulness. Um, so we might wanna look out and pay attention to our environment, grounding, exercise. One of my favorite ones is the five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> technique. So we first start with five things that we can see. Um, sometimes I like to do this with a color. So I might choose a color, you know, maybe I'll say blue. And I'm going to look around and find five blue things to look at. Once I've done that, I'm going to go with four. And I'm going to pick four things that I can touch. It can be anything. Or maybe I want to be even more specific. Maybe I want to say four soft things that I can touch or four cool things that I can touch. So I'm gonna need to go around and find four things that I can touch. Then we go three things that I can hear. And if it's allowable, if it's okay, maybe I close my eyes and I focus on what are three things that I can hear in this moment. And then we go to two things that I can smell. Um, maybe if we are, we can't really find sometimes, just as it goes down, it actually gets a little harder, right? So sometimes finding two things to smell can be a little tricky. So maybe, for example, I always like to keep um, lotion that has a smell that I find comforting. I tend to like peppermints. It's um, kind of like an invigorating smell. So maybe I might put on a lotion of a smell that's soothing and I might smell it. Um, or, you know, maybe there is something in my environment. I think plants, I also have a lavender plant that I love and I just kind of with, um, if, I, if I want to kind of just take a moment to, ch to connect. And the last one is one thing that I can taste. And, you know, this is where maybe we can have a cup of tea and maybe we can do both smell and taste. 
and touch. Actually, that's one of my favorite things is one of what I call my tea meditation. I like to hold it and focus on how warm it feels and then see if I can pick up on any smells. Um, I really enjoy kind of like the herbal teas. So sometimes you can pick up on those nice subtle smells and then taste. Um, I add in a little bit of maple syrup for an extra little fun um, and I can always pick up on that. So this is a really nice one for us to kind of go out, right? Um, mm -hmm. We can also focus on exercise. We can go for a walk and something that I love is called kiss the earth meditation. And we can imagine that our feet are kind of kissing the ground and we notice when our foot is stepping on the ground and focus on the step, um, the you know, kind of like the in and the out step and how it feels to walk. And then we can also focus, in, focus inwards. And maybe we use these skills different times. Maybe sometimes we need to go out and maybe sometimes we wanna go in. We want, we're okay reflecting. And this is where when we're going inwards, deep breathing can be a good skill, but that's if we are, if we feel grounded and if we feel safe, then deep breathing can be wonderful. We can also visualize, we can meditate, we can do a soft touch, um, again, even with lotion, giving ourselves a nice little hand massage. Um, I also, for example, keep things like a little roller, um, a little massage roller, and I might apply pressure as a little um, kind of massage. Another, this is a fun one. Um, so lightly touching our lip really softly, right around here. Our lip has a, has a good amount, I think I believe the most, a parasympathetic nervous system receptors. So when we lightly just touch it, our parasympathetic, um, right, which is our stop system, our stop response activates. So that's kind of a fun one. We can also do our cheek right here. Um, so you can touch really lightly and it's going, it feels really good too. I love the way it feels. Um, and it automatically activates our, the stress response system that's gonna deactivate those, you know, um, like the, the heart rate and, and all of those. And then for the last, we have a few minutes. I'm gonna kind of go quickly through this, but if anyone would like access to this PowerPoint, I'd be more than happy to give it just for more, um, and I can give my email. Um, so one that I love is called alternate breathing or nostril breathing. And for this breath, so the following breaths that I'm gonna show, I think can work for both inward and outward because they don't necessarily require too much introspection, right? It kind of has a mix. So I think these are really nice. So alternate breathing, we grab our thumb and we, we close one side of our nostril. Yep, and then we breathe in for four. And then with our other finger, we plug our other one and then we breathe out for six. So we kind of alternate between breathing in so we can practice to breathe in and then switch and then breathe out for six. And we alternate in that way. So we plug our right or our left nostril with our thumb and then plug our right one with your ring finger. Um, and you just kind of alternate before between four in breaths and then four exhales. I love that breath is one of my favorites. Some people do the same, so like this, but they put their these two fingers right on their, um, between their forehead. It's a, it takes a little bit of practice just to get like the hand gestures, um, but once you, we kind of get used to it, um, it's a beautiful breath. What I love about this breath is that it activates our right and our left hemisphere. So we're activating different parts of our brain, right? As we are kind of plugging one side to the other and it's uh, the combination of having all these beautiful, um, like our breath is very, our breath in our brain is very active during this breath. And again, I'm kind of moving quickly through these for the sake of time. The next one is uh, square breathing, kind of uh, similar in the sense of it has a lot of steps. So here what we do is we inhale for four. I like to count in my head or tap on my fingers. So I'll do one, two, three, four. So we would inhale, hold, exhale, and then hold and again repeat and so it's kind of this square and you keep going through it until we start to kind of feel our body decompressing and, and again I think we all this is the, the beauty of um, kind of self-awareness and exploration is we get to know our body you know maybe sometimes I might go through the square breathing three to four times maybe other times I, I need eight times and that's okay 
Um, I tend to use this one. So for before interviews <laughs> or any event, always works for me. So I always take, I might have done this right before this. I always take five, 10 minutes right before, do my square breathing and it, it tends to work really nicely. Oh, did it load? Why didn't we load? What's the next one? Hmm. Okay, so the next one is a breath mantra. So breath mantra, we choose a phrase or a word that we're going to do as we inhale and then exhale. So for example, I might say I'm breathing in positive loving energy and I exhale negative energy that no longer serves me. Or I might say I breathe in relaxation and I breathe out tension. And as we breathe, we simply do that. So we just inhale, uh, let's say calm and exhale stress. And we just repeat that word, right? So we repeat it over and over as we breathe in and as we breathe out. And then we have belly breath. So for belly breath, we put our hand on our chest and our hand on our belly. And then we take a nice big breath and our goal is to expand our abdomen. So we wanna see our belly kind of move out like a big balloon. And we focus on the way that it feels uh, to breathe out. And then the way our chest kind of drops. This is a really beautiful one. This can be sometimes a little hard for some individuals to have that physical touch. Um, so again, this is, we kind of might take some time to see what's gonna work for, for all of us in our in individual and unique um, breaths. And wait one second, so I'm gonna go out and see which one we missed. Okay, and then the other one is, oh, the graphic's just not working, that's okay. So it's the five, seven, eight, um, I'm sorry, the four, seven, eight. And the four, seven, eight breath is a four second inhale. So one, two, three, four, seven second hold, and then an eight second exhale. This one might take a little practice <laughs> just because we really might have to build that capacity to breathe out for the eight seconds, but it's a beautiful breath. Um, so we are coming to the end and um, I want to just thank everyone for, for being here and I hope that these were helpful. If anyone for any reason would like just a little bit more information, I am going to go ahead on the chat and drop my email. Um, give me one second. I'm just gonna drop it here. And again, I really just want to, oh, let me go to everyone, okay. I want to thank everyone so much and hoping that everyone has a wonderful day, a wonderful month. Um, does anyone, I know this thing cuts me off right at two o'clock, so if it does, my apologies, but if anyone has any questions, you know, please do feel free to reach out. Um, so yes, thank you so much. Does anyone have any Hello. questions? Mental Health Connecticut, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. That was really great. And yeah. If it's okay for you, once we get the recording, because we're creating blog posts for each of the sessions, um, I'd love to use some of those um, breathing graphics in the blog post, if that's okay. Or, or you yeah. let us know what we can use. But Absolutely. Um, okay. Not a problem. Yes. So again, thank you all for having us here. It's absolute pleasure um, for, us, for me to be here on behalf of Copper Beach and also just to, to be here to share and support. Um, so thank you very much and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.